Hello and welcome to my channel. I am Crystal Ann Compton and I'm so excited to be with you today. I have a great video. This is the video version of my most recent podcast. My podcast is Life Magnetics. If you're not subscribed, please get subscribed. Link in the description. And in this conversation, I have just a really meaty and juicy dialogue with Kelsey Aida. Now, Kelsey Aida is a spiritual teacher. She is a facilitator. She's a mentor. She's a best-selling author. And she's got so much knowledge and information and energy, like vibration, around the subject of manifestation and how to manifest, why it is that some of us can manifest and some of us can't, or for those who can manifest, how it is that we're not always able to manifest, just sometimes like, why does that happen? We talk about how surrender factors into manifestation and also gratitude, how gratitude is such a game changer. And I'm just covering the like the very bare minimum. This conversation went on for about an hour. I'm going to share it all with you. And I really, really do encourage you to watch the whole thing because I sense and I felt while I was in the conversation with Kelsey that I was receiving activations and adjustments. It's just the way her energy is. And I feel that you'll probably receive that as well. Again, this is Kelsey Aida. She's a wonderful, wonderful spiritual practitioner and light in this world. And I'm so grateful to be able to share her with you. But before I do, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and help this channel to grow. I really, really, really do appreciate it. All right. Let's get into it. Uh, Kelsey Aida is a best-selling author, podcaster, and transformation facilitator who has guided thousands of women, helping them to upgrade their lives and learn how to love themselves radically and completely. She's the author of a popular online blog. She offers online courses, one-on-one -on -one coaching, meditations, international retreats, and more. Welcome, Kelsey, to the Life Magnetics podcast. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you. Me too. I'm always down to talk about being magnetic, getting magnetic. As soon as I saw the title of your podcast, I was like, yes. <laughs> well, you know, this the, the name of the podcast happened, and I'm, I'm not so happy with it, actually, because it kind of <clears throat> sounds a little corporate America to me, like Life Magnetics mm. Corporation. But yeah. <laughs> it came after I was doing like a little bit of channeling about the multiple minds and the multiple dimensions of minds and how we're magnetic in every level and how we're always collecting energy and detritus. And so that's how it came into being truly because of the magnetic nature of our life, which I think you can get behind. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, before, it. before we get into the whole conversation, cause I do have so many questions for you. Um, why don't you start us off by introducing yourself? And I like to talk about like who you were, before your awakening, what led you to your awakening, why that happened, and then like how it happened? Yeah, great question. So I actually feel like I've had like two major awakenings. The first one happened when I was in my late teens, early adulthood, and I was suffering from depression, like hardcore. And I just fell down into this slippery slope of a hole until I got so low that I was like, contemplating suicide but I wasn't really suicidal like I never attempted suicide because I knew that like then I would just make other people sad and then that wasn't helping anybody so that was the beginning which is kind of a long story how I got there but long story short teenage hormonal imbalances not being able to live my dream of being a professional ballerina because I was injured in my back and my hip so like major parts of the body um and just overall lacking intimacy and connection with myself and others even though I had relationships with people and I was going to school and I was still functional I was just so sad and unfulfilled and just like wanting to sleep all the time which I think is the body's like way of coping with depression um, and eventually I got help I went to therapy I didn't want to use medicine because I knew that like hormonal like mess ups were part of the problem of why I was in that situation so I was like hardcore about it like my mindset my way out of this which I don't think is always the answer like I'm not against me a medication but I just didn't want to use it so eventually long story short I was able to ask for and attract the right resources, mentors, people, places, ideas, concepts, perspectives to help me get myself out of that hole. 
And when I got out after three years of being in it, I just was like having so much perspective and having access to to wisdom that like most 20 early 20 something year olds like wouldn't have (laughs) kind of like the perspective of an old person but being in like a 21 year old body (laughs) and I really wanted to teach people about life and how to feel better and how to change their perspective and how to change their reality and how to work with energy once I started understanding how it was working And so um, that's when my blog and my first book and all that came to be. And then a couple years later, fast forward to like my mid 20s, I went through a really intense breakup with my high school sweetheart who I was with for a long time. And it was like very, very devastating for me that we weren't going to be like together, didn't work out. And I just felt this soul calling to move to a place that was very green. And I had always lived in California, which some parts of California are green. The Bay Area is more green. That's where I grew up when I was little. But most of my life, I lived in San Diego, which is like the desert, not very green. And I just felt this strong pull to go somewhere mountainy, lush, trees, forests. And so eventually, (laughs) oh, this is another long story that I'll save for another day. I ended up in Columbus, Ohio, of all places. (laughs) So (laughs) random. Everyone was like, how why like what possessed you to move from san diego to columbus ohio right sounds like a downgrade in most people's mind but i was really just ready to switch it up and i had visited there once i thought it was super charming and adorable and i was like i'm just gonna move here so i moved there i didn't really know anybody i was finding my autonomy for the first time and i just was like meditating all the time, spending so much time by myself, um, exploring the city, hanging out in parks with the trees, going for walks. And um, I had a kundalini awakening one night, like spontaneously. And I felt like this energy moving through my spine, like, like on either side of it. And I was like, I've never felt this before. This is so weird. And so I was just like, feeling the feeling. It was cool. I was just letting it happen to me. And then the next day I was like reflecting on that weird, like bodily sensation. And I was like, "Mm, that was weird. What was that? And then like, when I asked that question in my mind, it was like, you had a Kundalini awakening. And I was like, well, I don't really know what that is. Like I know of Kundalini yoga, which I haven't even practiced. I've just heard of this term. (laughs) And so that little download popped into my head, Kundalini awakening. So I'm like, okay. So I start Googling. I'm like, yeah, sounds about right. I consult with my shaman friend. I'm like, hey, do you think it's possible that like, I might just have like a spontaneous like kundalini awakening? And he's like, yeah, that happens sometimes. Sounds about right with everything you've been going through. And I was processing a lot of heavy stuff from the breakup and everything. So, you know, one thing leads to another, have a kundalini awakening. <laughs> and that's when my psychic abilities came online, mm-hmm. which I think I've always had good channeling abilities like when I would dance it was like not from me you know I was like moving my body from the divine right I was being moved and like when I would write articles and write books I always felt that yes my perspective was inserted in there so I'm not a clear channel but I was definitely channeling some like universal wisdom and still do but in that moment after the kundalini awakening it was like And then I was basically like this psychic medium and I could connect with people on the other side and all this crazy stuff that I never really understood that I could do before. Um, And yeah, fast forward now after those two awakenings, um, creeping up on almost 30. And I'm just really passionate about using my gifts of insight and compassion and perspective to really just help people shift their realities and to help them just feel better because life is short. And I know like from being stuck in depression for so long, like I don't want anyone to have to suffer longer than is needed. Like, yes, there is gonna be some suffering on the human path, but like, let's not prolong the process if we don't have to. 100%, wow, what an amazing story. I have so many clarifying questions, but- <laughs> Yes, <laughs> whatever the, you want, the first, The first thing I wanna just kind of drill down into is first the relatability of the depressive state. I think there are so, so many people yeah. all around the world 
who are struggling with this. And it's not necessarily innate to them, like a chemical imbalance. I mean, the world is nuts. It's crazy. And so it can also put us into this depressive state. And what you said was that you um, began to kind of attract resources to you. And it's that that little step from being in the depressive Impressive cocoon to action and attraction. How do you make that step? How do you get out of it and do something? Yeah, um, I think for me personally, I hit my pain threshold <laughs> and I was just sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I made a decision and I kind of gave the universe an ultimatum. I was like, okay, I need to figure out how to feel better. So that's my intention now. I'm not just going to keep letting this happen to me. Like I'm freaking over it. And I was like, universe, help, like help a girl out here. Like, what do I have to do to enjoy my life again? Like, how did I get here? What, what's the next step? Like send help, (laughs) send help. (laughs) So really, I think it was the decision. And a lot of times the decision doesn't come until you hit your pain threshold, which is deeper for some than others. Um, But naturally, you know, us humans, we just don't really prefer the change route unless it's like absolutely Mm -hmm. necessary, which for me, it definitely was. Interesting. Okay. So the decision I'm going to change becomes an intention. My, I'm going to take steps to change. And then I know you work a lot with affirmations and we'll talk a little bit about that, but it really is once the intention is created and released, things begin to happen and shift. And sometimes that's all it takes, but it, it does require some follow-up, right? Like I'm gonna look for the resources, I'm gonna put myself out there. I love that you said <clears throat> that you were 21 years old and you wanted to um, teach about life because I know that there's gonna be, cause I'm middle-aged, I'm 54 years old. How dare you bring that up? <laughs> I'm 24 years old, but like, I, but I always say, I wish I was like in my 20s when these things were activated in me because I'd have so much more time and energy and all of the things. And to me, I really vibe with what you're saying because it's an activation that takes place. It's not like you have all this native understanding and education and knowledge. It's really something that comes alive within you that you begin to move in. Can you kind of? Um, talk to that a little bit. How did you just start teaching about life and feel the authority and confidence to do so? Yeah, I think the authority and confidence came from the experience. Like now that I have healed from this hardcore episode of depression that most people would say you can't get better without medicine, it's going to take this, that and this for you, like, there's no way like it's in your family, like you can't heal it, whatever, whatever. Like once I got through that, I just felt like I could do anything. And I felt that I had so many tools and resources and shifts that I made that would help other people too. So I've just always been teaching from life experience, which I've always felt like is the ultimate credential because if like, it's good for people to have certifications and training and knowledge and learn, but at the same time, if everybody's getting their information from the same courses, the same certifications, the same universities, no new thought will ever be born. So for me, I'm just like, well, I'm just coming in hot with what's been working for me. <laughs> <laughs> and it has been helping many, many people. And now it's expanded into a podcast and a coaching business and retreats. And I think I've I've always had the gift too of perspective and making things easy to understand. Like when I was little, other kids in my class, when they wouldn't get the lesson at the playground, I would just be like, oh, just think of it like this. Or I would explain it to them from a different perspective and they would get it so fast. And the teacher would explain it all day. They're all super confused. They're not understanding. And then I would just be like, look at it this way. They'd be like, oh, that's so simple. Why didn't the teacher just say that? And I'm like, I don't know, but now I'm saying it. Now you understand. So (laughs) let's do it, you know? Yeah. I I love that. Do you believe in past lives? Do you think like some of this activation is bringing in the knowledge from past lives? Yeah. I think I've been here like a million billion times and I just keep coming back for like the mac and cheese to help other people (laughs) out, you know? (laughs) You're you're not tired yet at all? Like you're you're down for reincarnation after this No, I don't think I'm tired of the human experience yet. I mean, it can be tiring like Mm -hmm. from my human perspective. Some days I'll be like, oh, freaking tired of this can't believe I chose this again like come on (laughs) but I think I don't know I just feel like humanity needs me I just look at humanity and I see how like messed up some things are and I'm like wow we have a long way to go still this is like honestly embarrassing like people we need to get it together (laughs) 
<laughs> I love it. Oh, yeah. Preach. Um, so you're, as you're talking, I come from a Christian background, a fundamentalist Christian, and I left Christianity and, you know, now I'm a psychic on the internet, but um, <laughs> for w what you're talking about is, and I can tell with you, um, you have a gift of exhortation, which is the explanation and the inspiring in people, which is a spiritual gift. You also Thank have the you. gift of hospitality the way I contextualize it, which is just your um, innate vibration that you hold within you has the power to shift and change spaces and people maybe without even saying a whole lot but just you're able to hold that light mm. and just i mean you said such a bold thing which is like i i and i don't i'm going to paraphrase but something like i'm here to change the world and i think that so many people in the world want to do the same thing i think we actually all came here to do that in our own way yeah but they don't know how they don't they don't have the self-worth they don't have the confidence they have the who me what do i what can i contribute how can people tap into their divine power and place in this particular reality what's yeah. the first thing somebody could do if they wanted to turn that on yeah well first off thank you for the psychic reading of in the confirmation <laughs> Because I definitely agree with you. And part of the reason I've been loving retreats is because of that being in the same physical space with other people and having that help activate and heal without, yeah, you're right, like without having to say much. So that's something that another psychic friend has told me too. So that's pretty <laughs> cool that you reflected that back to me. But um, yeah, I think for people who are feeling like imposter syndrome or not confident, you have to remember that you're the only person in the world who is you and who sees the world through your lens. And you're the only person with your experience and your gifts. So everybody's like a thumbprint, right? You, so even if, even if there, you feel like there's a million other life coaches out there talking about the same stuff, because at the end of the day, there is a lot of universal truth getting circled around. And so there's not a lot of new information like to be had, right? So you have to think of it like, there are certain people that are going to resonate with the way that you say it or the way that you show up or the way that you frame it and to be playing small and not living in your light and not expressing that you're not only doing yourself a disservice, but you're doing all the people who are needing your medicine a disservice. Mm -hmm. So like in the beginning for me, for example, I would film YouTube videos and be like, oh my God, I hate how my lips move. I hate how I sound. I sound so stupid. I look so bad, blah, blah, blah. You know, all that natural self-judgment that comes up when you show up online. <laughs> <laughs> and one day I just had to be real with myself and be like, yo, is this about you or is this about the message? Like, is this about you or is this about the medicine? And I was like, oh, yes. Yeah. Like talking to myself, like, yeah, you're right. I need to get over it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not about me. Like it's so much bigger than me. So I think that helps to drive me too. And that's something that people can take away of like, it's not about you, but it is about like what you can bring to the table and your message and your gifts and your expression in whatever way feels good to you. Like everybody has a unique way of showing up and contributing to the world. So it doesn't have to look the same as mine or someone else's either. Right. And please, let's not all look the same. I pop on yeah, Instagram so and I just see a lot of people dancing and pointing at words on Instagram and like mm -hmm. a lot of glossy performative spirituality. And I'm like, where's the real ones? Where yeah. the gritty ones? Where the earthy ones? Where the ones who are saying shit, you know, yeah. and having a glass of wine and also trying to be spiritual. I'm human and I'm also trying to be spiritual. Like that's yeah. what I personally relate to. And I, and I a hundred percent agree. One of the things that I teach my students, um, and I teach intuitive abilities and stuff like that, among other things, is the only thing that you have to cultivate is the ability to get out of your own way. Like, yeah. how can you move a little bit to the side, become a vessel, fill up with light, and then just express it? That's all you have to do. And then God does the rest every single time. Yeah. And it's always perfect. It's yeah. when you're in the way that things start to get jacked up. Yeah. Um, and another thing that you mentioned um, talking about teaching and I assume healing because you've gone through it, you've amassed the tools and now you can turn around on the path and hand those off to somebody else. Um, I think that the most powerful teaching and the most powerful healing is while you're in process because it's alive in you. Yeah. Because you're learning, you're downloading, you're adjusting. And then right afterwards, that's when it's the most alive. But I think people struggle because when we're in process, which by the way, we're going to be in process for the rest of our life, like get used to right. it. But 
they think, well, I'm not perfect. How can I heal? Like I'm not well, I've got chronic illness. How can I be a healer? Or um, I don't have all of the tools, the knowledge, how can I teach? And so it's that divine self-concept again. What do you have to say like to the wounded healer? Like, are they powerful? Are they less powerful? What is your take on that? Yeah, the wounded healer. Ooh, yeah. I think in some ways they are more powerful because they're more in touch with what their people, their clients need help with. Um, the people that are wanting their healing and their medicine. And I think it's just like what you said, are you going to make it mean that you can't heal people just because you're not fully perfect, a thousand percent healed? Like to me, that's not really a good enough excuse. Like life is short. You probably have like a hundred years here. Like to, to use that as your excuse not to help others when you have help to be given, I just think is a little bit of a cop out. So if anyone's listening and they're like, ah, that's me. Like I am the wounded healer. Like that's fine. <laughs> Everybody has wounding. Everybody has wounds. You don't have to be perfectly healed to help others. You don't have to be a certain age to help others. One time this is a hater on Instagram was like, you're not even old enough to help anybody. And I was like, I didn't know there was an age limit to being helpful to people, <laughs> but thank you for your negative feedback. Um, and honestly, like, like you said, we're always going to be in progress. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to say, I can't help people or I can't heal people because I'm not perfectly healed, then you're never going to do it. <laughs> so right. I don't think that's a great idea. I don't think that's very beneficial. And I think the best thing you can do is have compassion for yourself and treat yourself the way that you treat the people that you heal, treat yourself the way that you would treat one of your clients, like, what would you tell them? Would you tell them, oh, you everything is negated because you have a disease or all your gifts don't matter because right now you're going through a hard time? Like, no, nobody is immune to the human experience, no matter how high vibrational you become. And I think this is like the lie of manifestation. Like, oh, once I vibrate so, so high, like nothing bad will ever happen to me. I'll control all my circumstances. I'll never get sick. Like no bad things can touch me. And it's like, yes, of course, when you raise your vibration, you're going to experience more harmony naturally, but you're not immune from the human experience. You came here as a soul into a body to have a human experience. So to deny that or to suppress that or to try and disown it and just go back to the ethers, even though you're still here in your body, I think is just not beneficial and like not what we came here to do. So I say embrace your humanity. I 100% agree. <laughs> now you're talking about manifestation. This is a subject that I, I love. I subscribe to specific teachers, um, but I mean, whatever, we're always manifesting. I love Neville Goddard, for example. Mm -hmm. um, the OG. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Everything is just you pushed out. But um, in my uh, own manifestation practice, again, we're always manifesting, but like when I'm trying to intentionally manifest yeah. something, and also with people that I know, spiritual people who are trying to manifest something, it seems like um, I can manifest it sometimes, but then I can't man. And when I really want it, it's harder to manifest. Mm -hmm. And it's like this juggling thing that we're like, okay, I'm going to fill up. I'm going to be high vibe because that's when I'm the most God magnetic. And then I'm going to try and intentionally manifest this. But I'm also worried, like, what if it doesn't manifest? So like, there's so many different things coming through when I try to manifest things and when others try to manifest, manifest things. So can you speak to why it would be that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, or that people just say it just don't work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is a super awesome and loaded question. I love it. I'm actually working on a book right now called why the law of attraction works for some people, but not you okay. literally Perfect. 70, 000 plus words to answer the question that you just asked, but <laughs> to give like a more concise example or like a few answers instead of like the whole, all the million reasons why it could be like not working in that moment. I think a lot of times what we're missing, and let's talk about manifesting something really that you feel is big, something that you really, really want, something that you're like super attached to, right? I think that God, the universe, or, you know, us on a soul level actually makes it take longer to manifest those things so we can have more time to be more ready. 
Because what you wouldn't want is to get what you want, but you're not ready to sustain it, to hold it, to amplify it, to carry it. So I have this theory that a lot of times we or life or the universe make it take a little more time so that we can be a little more ready. And you have it's a it's a more gentle form of lining up with what you want instead of just what we think we want, which is I want it now, give it to me. But you don't realize all the ways that you're not ready yet, or you wouldn't be ready, or you wouldn't feel as good as you could if it happened in a few months or a few years from now. So I think that's a big piece is like timing and time passing in your favor (laughs) in order for you to line up with the manifestation. I think that's a really overlooked aspect of it but most of the time what can be blocking our manifestations from happening or from happening more quickly is that we and I'm sure you can attest to this working with energy and being a someone who sees a lot of information that a lot of times it's an internal resistance which can look like in my conscious mind I want to manifest my soulmate but my heart is still broken from the last relationship so my heart protector is like, uh, no, not ready. Don't want that. Love is dangerous. This is horrible. I hate dating. Like there is a part of you that's like totally not on board with what you think you want. Right. And it could be very true that you do want that and you're almost ready for that. But that's where you have to invite yourself to do the work of like, OK, let's tend to the parts of me that are not on board with this, the part of me that's scared to love again, the part of me that's still heartbroken, the part of me that hates dating. Let's open up a conversation with those aspects, help them to relax, help them to feel safe, help kind of sell them on this new relationship (laughs) and how beneficial it could be for all parties involved in your psyche. And from there, it can be so much easier. So a lot of the work that I do with my clients is heart's work and beliefs work and just looking at those resistances, which sometimes you can't always see by yourself, which I think is like why it's really beneficial to have a practitioner in your corner every once in a while when you need them. But resistance, I would say, is the quote unquote enemy when it comes to manifesting, even though like I don't like to make enemies of things, but that's the best word I've found for it. It's like that's the main blockage and it can show up in that example that I gave or it can show up in, you know, the form of like, having secret hidden beliefs that the thing that you want is bad right a lot of us are not aware of our beliefs that like this is bad that is wrong my mom wouldn't approve you know whatever it is um but even like a lot of times we try to manifest things from a place of resisting where we are now so that's another form of resistance like if you don't accept your life like yeah you don't have to like it you can change your mind you can go in a new direction but if you can't accept the present and make it okay then you're in a state of resistance to where you are which is still resistance maybe you're not resisting what could be coming what's coming in but you're still energetically closed you know like if we're going to describe resistance it would be like you're closed you're not open for business door is closed sign is closed like your energy is closed not a lot of movement going on the antidote to that well it depends on the form of resistance but really is to be open And that can look like feeling your feelings, even if they're uncomfortable. That can look like looking at your reality, even if it's not perfect yet. That can look like opening yourself to possibility where maybe you don't fully believe that's possible for you, but you're like, well, I believe it could happen in some reality. So I'm open to it. I don't really think it's going to happen, but I'm open. Like maybe it could, universe surprise me, you know? So in short, resistance or you're not ready or it's not ready a lot of the times we want our manifestations to be boom 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 but like do you want it now or do you want it better because it might be taking a little time to get all the details right Mm -hmm. and that has nothing to do with you that's just the universe's timeline just gathering all the resources moving people around getting stuff done and you don't know right you're not going to know probably never going to know honestly even when you receive it you probably won't know all the details and orchestration that went into the manifestation becoming but yeah in short resistance or timing okay um so one of uh, neville goddard's famous lectures is called order then wait mm-hmm. and uh, my friend trisha carr 
likened that to like going to the restaurant, right? Ordering a cheeseburger, mm -hmm. you put in your order, but then you, and they, the waiter goes and delivers it. You don't sit there worrying the entire time. Right. You call the waiter back and check, is it, is it coming? When's it coming? No, exactly. you relax and you just, you just um, surrender into the process of whatever. And you're present also, maybe you're sitting across from someone, you're enjoying yourself, right? You're having an appetizer or something. I think people often call back the manifestation that they set in motion through doubt or, you know, there's magical tenets here too. Like um, when you are trying to manifest something through magic, you do whatever you do with an effigy or with, you know, sigils and things like that. And then you put it away and you don't think about it, right? And when it happens, it's almost like a surprise, like, oh yeah, what a blessing. Well, do you subscribe to that as well? Like, um, I remember like I would do like lists of things I wanted to manifest for a year as opposed to a vision board. I'd put it away in some sort of a shelf. And then at the end of the year, I'd pull it out and be like, bam, look at all this that I got that I wanted. What, what is that, that component of putting it away? And, and do you think that that's a vital part of manifestation? I think for some people it is. Okay. I think different things are more exciting to different people and different things help people release resistance more or less. So for example, for some people, I think it is beneficial to like visualize it a couple days a week, like tune into the energy more often than not. And like, it gets them excited and pumped up and like ready to receive. But for other people, they can do that same process and get discouraged. So instead right. of instead of getting excited every time they think about it, they're like, oh, I'm thinking about it again. Two weeks later, it hasn't happened yet. And then they get into the <laughs> whole like noticing that it's not there, which is going to be blocking it. So I personally like to do both. I like to set it and forget it. And I like to just like be in the vibe of it when I feel excited or optimistic about it. So I, I think I do both personally. And I think it depends on the person and like their approach too. Cause I, cause a lot of times revisiting it can go wrong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so for many people, it's definitely better the approach that you're describing to just like set it and forget it. So you mentioned resistance quite a bit, and I want to talk about epigenetics. I want to talk about ancestral curses. I want to talk about patterns mm -hmm. that are passed down generation to generation that are existing inside of like the spiritual DNA and our actual cells and in, in our DNA, we are. I believe we are holding the beliefs of our mother, grandmother, grandfather, and all of those that came before and their beliefs too. And so sometimes I might be out here trying to manifest something and I feel like I've got my consciousness, my vision on, you know, it's where it needs to be. I've also got the vibration and the feeling where it needs to be, but there's a little sub signal in there from my grandfather who had fear around this thing. Cause he was a writer. Maybe you know, I'm always trying to write my book, like those sub signals that we're not conscious to that are also ancestral, I believe are a real deal. How do you take care of that kind of stuff? How do you clear those sub signals that you're, you are the frequency that's attracting? Yeah, this is interesting because I think a lot of times ancestral stuff and like trauma that lives in the lineage will manifest in our lives in a really present day way. So like, <laughs> if it's still a problem that needs to be healed, like it'll be your personal problem. It'll manifest as an issue for you that you're having personally, like in your life so that you can be invited to like work through and heal that. Um, I've honestly found that working with a facilitator who is psychic, who is open, who is gifted is the best way to get into those blind spots because it can be hard to do it by yourself, on yourself, with yourself. Um, but I like to think that like, if it's something that I need to clear, like it's going to come up for me as a personal issue. And when it does, then I can deal with it then. That's kind of like my belief in how and how it works. And a lot of times, like for me personally, if I sense that there's something like that going on behind the scenes and I don't know, I'll consult like a healer and be like, hey, is there something going on here? And mm -hmm. she'd be like, oh yeah, there's some stuff on her mom's side. And I'm like, oh, that makes so much sense. Like, yes, that makes sense because of what happened to her, what happened to her mom. And now I'm kind of like playing out the same thing. And when you can bring it to your awareness, I think that's what gives you the choice points. Yeah. And I think there's lots of different ways to bring it to awareness. Like you can, you if if you're someone who is open enough to receiving your own intuitive downloads which sometimes is hard because we get like you know we get all in our head um 
I think journaling about it, praying about it, asking about it, meditating on it is a good way to get some intel, some answers. But if you feel like you're not getting clarity, sometimes I think it's okay to ask for help from other people who can see really clearly with non-attachment and just give you some information and insight there. Wonderful. Okay. So when it's popping up in your present now moment, and it's actually related to your great grandmother and you know that, or you don't know that, but you do what it takes to clear it within you in your field. Do you feel like that also clears it in the, the lineage? Does it go back to great? I think, do you think yes so? and no. I think like from a linear human mind, like we can't change history, right? We don't change the past. It already happened. It's like written out. Here's what happened. But I think on a quantum and spiritual level, there's definitely healing to be had for all parties involved when you are someone in the line who mm -hmm. is clearing something or overcoming a challenge. I think it definitely does raise the vibration of all and it can rewrite some, some things. Okay. <laughs> so <both>. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And I think if you're conscious to it and with intention, you clear it for yourself and also all those that come before you, I think there you can start to send it down the line. Um, a couple more questions in manifestation before we get into this radical self-love that you like to talk about. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the role of surrender in manifestation. Mm -hmm. And I always go to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the night before he's going to be crucified. He knows what's coming down the line. He asks his two best friends, the disciples, can you just stay up with me? I just need friends. Of course, they fall asleep. And he ends up praying. And he says, essentially, can you take this cup from me? Like, can you somehow get me out of this terrible situation? I know why I'm here. I know I'm supposed to serve, but I don't want to do it. But he ends it with saying, but thy will be done. And that's the surrender. And of course, it doesn't, it doesn't come for him, right? He still has to go through the process. And I think that this is tied to a question that I have is like, why is it so hard to manifest stuff that we really need right now? Like, or that we need it all. Like, I really need to pay my mortgage this, mortgage this month. Please, can I manifest this? But it's harder to do it. And where is the role in surrender in manifestation? Can you speak to that? Yeah, great questions. Okay, so this is two parts. So let me go back to part one. Why is it harder to manifest things that we really need? Yes. Okay, so I think... Well, speaking from personal experience, to manifest things that we really need, when we're in that energy of need, or in that energy of like, uh, grasping, gripping, it's just hard to like, do your ethereal energy work and like be high vibrational, right? You're just like in the humanness, you're just like in it. So oftentimes, if I'm in that situation, I'll go more into a 3D mode and I'll get more into my mind and I'll be like, how can I resource myself with what I need? And I will think on it instead of like asking the universe, like, please send this to my doorstep. I'll be like, okay, I need to get practical. Like, where can I find a therapist? Like, how can I make this money? Like, do I need to pick up a second job? Like, I think it's not wrong to manifest through action, right? So when we're having those moments of despair, like you can do something and you don't have to just journal it into existence. Like you can go audition for the thing. You can go interview. You can submit your resume. You can try again. You can try a different way. Um, so I think in those moments, what helps me release resistance is like trusting myself and like moving energy in the 3D. Like, okay, what can I actually do to like get my need met? Do I need to go out so I can make more friends so I'm not lonely? Do I need to get on a dating app so I can meet someone who I want to be romantically involved with? Um, I think a lot of times in the manifestation law of attraction space, we want it to be so simple where we just write it down and it shows up Amazon Prime delivery style, just right to the doorstep. <laughs> but we forget that like we have these human bodies and these human minds and these abilities to use both to make shit happen. <laughs> you don't have to just wait for it to appear out of thin air. You can do something about it. So for me, I I like to just like, okay, like if it if I feel like I can't manifest it and I'm too like just energetically like distressed, I think something that really helps me feel empowered again is to take action in the 3D and like move the needle, whatever that is applying to the situation. 
because I think that helps you to release the resistance because mm-hmm. you're already in fear when you're in survival mode, right? So the right. chances of you lining up with the belief and like the body space of like, oh, it'll come when it comes, like that's not very comforting when you're like in distress and you need it now. I think it feels more empowering to like go for it in that instance instead of trying to like bring it to you. But at the same time, it doesn't mean it's not possible. It's just that you have to do what feels more empowering or more relieving to you in that moment. If it doesn't feel like relief to pray about it or to wait for it to come or to trust that it's going to happen, if it feels more relieving to go do something about it, then do that. That's fine. You're allowed to do both. Um, And then to answer your second question about surrender, I think it plays a huge part in the manifestation process because when you surrender, which can be supported by you trusting your life, believing in God, believing in the universe, believing that there's a plan, believing that there's reason and logic behind everything that's happening. When you can trust and come to a place of surrender, you just release so much worry, fear, and doubt that you really just like rise very naturally to the energetic space that is conducive to what you're wanting to create. So I think if you can reach a place of surrender, it's super, super, super beneficial. And it comes back to what we were talking about before, like the set it and forget it. Mm -hmm. If you knew for certain that it could happen or would happen, what would you do in the meantime? What would you do in the meantime to enjoy yourself while you're waiting? What are you going to do to enjoy the wait? And also, what would you do in the meantime to prepare yourself for when it does come to become the person who has that experience. Oh, that's juicy. What would you do in the meantime? That's really good. What a good tip. I'm writing that yeah. down. It's like if you knew with absolute certainty it was going to happen. It's happening. It's done. You put it out there. It's done. It's going to come in one year and 11 days or whatever it is. What are you going to do now? What are you going to do in the meantime? Are you going to keep obsessing over it? Are you going to keep worrying about it? Or are you going to focus on something else? Are you going to try a new hobby? Are you going to eat an appetizer at the restaurant. Like, what are you going to do while you're waiting for your order? (laughs) How important is gratitude when it comes to manifestation? Mm, I think it's like a major manifesting hack. (laughs) I think it's going to be hard without it to like be really powerful because it's just a quick way to line up with a very, very, very high frequency. And I will say during my first awakening, when I was healing from depression, a gratitude journal, a gratitude practice was one of the most potent forms of medicine for me at that time. And I practiced it for about three weeks. And this was while I was going to therapy and getting resource in other areas. But I think the gratitude journal is what really helped to pull me out of the hole in the most potent way possible. Because One, obviously it helped me to change my vibration, but two, it helped me to change my focus in life because when you're depressed and it's like in your brain and you don't understand why you're depressed, you try to make reasons to explain your depression, which just makes you more depressed because you're always looking for what's wrong, what's bad, what's not working to validate how you feel. So you don't feel crazy, which makes sense, but then it backfires because then you just keep spiraling lower and lower and lower. But when I started the gratitude practice, I had to force myself to look for what was right, what was working, what I was blessed with, what was good in my life and in life in general. And little by little, it it got easier and I got better at it and I felt better about it. And I, before I knew it, like I had reprogrammed my brain to look for everything good, which is such a different lens. And it's going to give you such a different experience even if you have the same exact life, right? You can be looking at the same exact life circumstances from a perspective of, let me find everything that's wrong (laughs) versus let me find everything that's right, everything that's working, everything that I'm blessed with. And that is like major, major, major power. It's so simple. Can you share with folks um, simply how to keep a gratitude journal? Like what did you do? How, How did that work for you? Yes. So I actually wrote a whole article on this that I'll also point you guys to if you want to read it like more Mm -hmm. in depth on my website. If you go to KelseyAida.com, there's a search bar, just search gratitude journal and you should find the the blog post because I did a long one on it a while ago, but I'll explain it here too. 
So for me, I'm an overachiever. <laughs> I don't know if you could tell us about me, but <laughs> I, a friend taught me, she said, oh, I have this gratitude journal. And of course I was depressed at the time. So I was like, well, that sounds stupid, but like, <laughs> I'll try it. So, <laughs> so I was like, okay, one journal just for gratitude. And I would wake up every morning. First thing, before you look at your phone, before you get up to pee, before you drink your water, first, first thing, you open your eyes, you roll over, you grab your journal and your pen, and you write three things that you're thankful for. They can be big, they can be small. At first, they were so stupid. Like, I would be like, oh, I'm thankful for my bed because all I want to do is sleep. I'm thankful for life cereal because I love empty carbs. Like, I'm thankful that, <laughs> I mean, I have like people who love me, I guess, even though I'm like not about life right now. So, <laughs> It can start small and then it gets bigger, right? Like I'm thankful for this air that I breathe and thankful for my body and all my extremities. And I'm thankful that my voice works good. And you, you know, you just get into the flow of gratitude, but at least three things, you can go as long as you want. If you want to go for 20 minutes and making a whole list, go for it, but three minimum. And then at night I would write three things that went right that day or three synchronicities that I noticed or three more things that I was grateful for. So for example, I would write like, oh, I saw a butterfly. Like that was so cool. Or um, someone held the door open for me at the coffee shop or, you know, I didn't think about hurting myself today or whatever like wins that you had or like universal synchronicities that you had writing those down because that way you start your day and end your day with gratitude. And you can go as long as you want. It doesn't have to be just three things, but morning and night, at least three things and try to make them different things every day. Don't cheat and say the same three things every morning <laughs> and the same three things every night. Okay, you got to stretch your consciousness here to find more stuff, but it's as simple as that. And I would say commit to it for at least three weeks to a month and then you can do it as needed. But um, I don't practice it in a journal form every day anymore. It's more just like here and there if I'm in meditation or I'm just looking out the window or whatever. Um, but that's a great way to start. Awesome, thank you for that. That's um, yeah. it's really a great thing to do. And I also believe in um, throwing in a Ho'oponopono prayer in the morning mm. and in the evening to just cut all the cords, honey. Gratitude yep. and cut the cords, mm -hmm. wonderful. Clear it. And it. super, super easy, super easy. Well, let's get into this radical self-love. Sounds sexy. Sounds sexy. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my gosh. So. I'm glad that you say that because I feel like people always think that the manifesting is more sexy than the self-love. And I'm like, you guys, it's really not. Mm -hmm. Like the self-love is the more sexy part that actually helps you manifest all the things. <laughs> so so what is your what is your idea of radical self-love? And are most of us not in love with ourselves? Like, Talk to us about this. Yeah. So my idea of radical self-love is to not just like yourself and it's not even to be like obsessed with yourself, like how you might assume based on the wording, right? Like, oh, she radically loves herself. She must be obsessed. She must be conceited. Like, no, it's not that. <laughs> it's more like loving and embracing all of you the good, the bad, the ugly, the wanted, the unwanted, the gorgeous, the messy, like, can you embrace and take in all parts of yourself, all aspects of your being, which is like, for example, a practice of radical self love that I've been doing the last couple of years is I'm someone who tends to be on the anxious spectrum, because I care a lot, I can tend to worry a lot. And so for me, taking in my anxiety and like caretaking that and understanding that and understanding where it was coming from and why I was doing it is a form of loving my anxiety. Do I love that I have anxiety? Do I love when I'm in an anxious episode? No, nobody loves that experience itself. But can I accept it, understand it and like just love that I care so much and that's why I worry? Yes. So radical self-love is not to like everything about yourself, but it's to truly love and embrace everything about yourself from a place of compassion, understanding, non-judgment. That's more the vibe. So how do you get there? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> I think there are many ways, but I think 
Well, like for example, in my course, Radical Self-Love, I have students start off by looking at where they don't love themselves and what they don't like about themselves. Because it's easy to love the parts of you that are like lovable, right? Like I love that I help people. I love that I write books. I love that I have this awesome hair. Like I love whatever, whatever. Like that's easy. We don't need to work on that. Like it's already there, right? So let's troubleshoot. Let's see where we're lacking in love, right? So people might write down things like, oh, I hate that I sabotage all my relationships or I hate that I'm so mean to myself or I hate that I'm so mean to other people or you know I don't like this part of my body or whatever and then from there we like do some transformation of basically understanding the part of yourself that you don't like (laughs) and this involves getting curious (laughs) dropping judgment which is not always easy And really approaching yourself from a place of genuine curiosity. Like if you had a good reason for being this way, let's get curious and see why you do this detrimental thing. Let's get curious and see where you picked up this habit. Let's see why your personality is like this. How has it been serving you? What is it trying to do for you? How is it trying to help you? What does that cellulite represent? You're aging. Congratulations. You're getting older. You get to live more. Like there's a reframe for everything, right? But truly it's a practice I feel. And what I work with my clients and my students on is like, okay, if you can just drop the judgment for like two minutes, oh, not forever, just like temporarily, let's try it. Let's experiment. And if you could really get curious about the parts of yourself that you don't like, And you can have a conversation with them or just ask the right questions. Like, well, what I like to do a lot is like parts work where let's say somebody is struggling with their inner critic and that's like something they don't like about themselves. And it's something that's like blocking them from loving themselves. I will have them like go into trance essentially. And then like go into that, um, that consciousness of that part. So all the other parts of them, I just have a step step off stage for a moment. And it's almost like an acting exercise. Like if your inner critic was a person, like be her for five minutes. And then I will speak to the inner critic directly and be like, okay, like when did you become a part of her? Like, what are we trying to help her with? What's your intention here? And always when we ask these good questions, it's like, oh, well, I'm not trying to hurt her. I just want her to be the best version of herself. I just want her to not get criticized by the outside world. I just want this, that, and this, whatever good intention that is. And when you can identify the pure positive intention behind your dysfunctions, behind your flaws, behind the parts of yourself that you don't like, you naturally come to a place of compassion. And you naturally are like, oh my gosh, like come here, let me give you a hug. I'm sorry that you feel like you have to do this for me. <laughs> And a lot of times you can help that part or that aspect pick a new job or help in a more beneficial way. (laughs) Because a lot of times like these aspects of us that are self-sabotaging or detrimental or that we don't like, they don't know how much they're hurting. They're just hurting you. Like they don't, they think that they're helping because they're coming from a good intention. So they think that it's working. But when you bring it to their attention, like, oh, so you really want her to feel confident and you want her to feel perfect. But did you realize that by criticizing her every five minutes, you're doing the exact opposite. And then the inner critic would be like, (laughs) I didn't realize I was doing that. You're right. This is not helping me get to the goal. (laughs) So it's, it's a lot of understanding and then the understanding naturally leads to compassion and then the compassion naturally leads to taking that part back in instead of making it an an enemy and causing fragmentation so it sounds like you're kind of working a process Uh, does someone need a facilitator to do this can someone do their own self-inquiry and curiosity do you have a book for did you write a book for this my friend yeah i actually did just okay. recently create a short book. I call it the mini book of self-love for the modern woman because it's only 40 pages. And I go into like three of my best, most important practices that I do with clients. But you definitely don't need a facilitator always. I think it's easiest to learn that way in the beginning. But like you don't have to be dependent on that. And I have walked people through this in the book. And then also like at my retreats, I teach people and I teach people to um, in that course that I mentioned before, the radical self-love one, because there's definitely a way where you can do it in like a journal practice where you step into the consciousness of the part that you want to understand and learn to love. And then you interview it and you have it write down the answers to the questions. And then you come back as yourself. And, you know, there's a whole process to it. But 
yeah, that's one of the main pillars of my practice of radical self-love is taking every part of you back instead of pushing yourself away from yourself instead of causing fragmentation and splitting of the psyche and like of your soul like at being at war with yourself it's like okay how can I make peace with this part how can I understand this part how can I accept and transmute this part and then you just feel so much more whole and healed who are a handful of your primary teachers like the teachers that have influenced you the most over time yeah Great question. So in the beginning of my journey, it was so much Abraham Hicks because I was like, whoa, this is cool. (laughs) Right. But then I like got a little bit annoyed with it because I was like, well, Abraham's not like a person in the 3D. Like they're on this different level where like manifestation is a little bit different. So then I started getting like slightly just like annoyed. That's too strong of a word. But I was just like, they don't get it. They're not a human right now. They don't like understand on the human level. So then there was, in the beginning, there was a lot of Deepak Chopra. There was a lot of Gabby Bernstein. There was a lot of Tony Robbins. There was a lot of Osho. Um, Who else? There were so many. Now I really love Matt Kahn. He's Mm -hmm. one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Love him to death. Um, I really love Teal Swan. I think she's so brilliant and awesome. That's what about the big, what about the documentary? Did you watch oh, it? Oh, I didn't. No, I didn't okay, watch it. You're that. not going to. Okay. All, it's, so, no. all right. All right. I'm just, not even okay. going to like put energy towards okay, that documentary because okay. I, I haven't know, watched like, how... I haven't watched it either. So I, I know I just... that it's made to paint her in a bad light that yeah. is untrue. And I've been to many of her events in person and I've felt her energy and I know like the intent of the work that she's doing. So as soon as I saw the trailer for that, I was like, no, they're just doing, you know, like classic mm-hmm. witch hunt, like trying to turn it into a cult and it's not and you know that whole thing but I actually love her work it's so awesome and who else am I really into these days honestly it's become less and less because I'm trying to tune more into just like my right and my source because in the beginning Mm -hmm. there was so much but now it's just like dwindling where yeah I like this perspective this sounds nice oh I like playing with that exploring that but I'm really just wanting to be more clear so it's kind of been falling away over time. Yeah, that's that's exactly why I asked the question because I think that at some point, I mean, if I were to turn the camera, you just see big wall of books. Of course, knowledge and study is very important, but you do find yourself um, not teacherless, but like you're just you're you're out here being a vessel. You're the instrumentation, yeah. the apparatus of spirit, and it's going to show up in a, a variety of different ways that you can't necessarily read in a book or have, you know, go to some sort of program and learn from, and those things are good, but I just feel like observing you, like that's where you are. And um, I think when we're at that jumping off place where it really becomes something unique to you as the vessel, maybe something people aren't talking about, they're not teaching. It can be so scary sometimes like to trust that, to yeah. trust that God's got it. But like, I feel like you're doing that. I'm really impressed by you, oh, your ability you. to articulate these concepts and make them utilizable. Because I mean, everybody can talk about, you know, sacred geometry and like the flower of life and Drunvalo Melchizedek, but we need people to be able to actually speak to people where they are in a way that they can hear it. And yeah, you- that's exactly how I feel. Like, I feel like it needs to be practical, relatable, everyday life stuff. Because like I said, the spiritual journey, like we came here as spirits into physical form to be a human. And like so many people are using their spirituality to escape their humanity. And that's not it. Like I promise that's just not, that's <laughs> not the purpose of why you did all this. So yes, it is fun to play around in the astral and to float in the ethers and to do all the spiritual stuff and even use it as escapism. Sometimes I'm guilty, you know, it's fun. We all do it. But at the end of the day, like I really value quality of life. So my whole thing is like anything that comes to me as a download or a perspective shift or an upgrade that I can share with people that I know is going to improve their day to day, moment to moment quality of life that's more what I'm interested versus alien, sacred geometry, blah, blah, blah. Right. <laughs> because it's like, okay, that's fun and cool to like think about and explore. And like, I'm an air sign. So I like to be in my head and like think a lot. But at the same time, like how are the aliens helping me in my daily life? Probably not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I, th I feel like I just could talk to you forever, um, but I did want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, your offerings and let's start yeah. with your retreats. Like, so where are your retreats? How often do you hold them? How can somebody sign up and go to one of your retreats? Yes, thank you. So I host a radical self-love retreat specifically for women only, girls only, once to twice a year in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Ooh. So we go to the beach, we stay in this gorgeous villa, we do healing work, we hang out with each other, we laugh, we cry, but we also like ride ATVs, go out to dinner. It's like a girl's trip meets a spiritual retreat. Like you don't have to just eat lettuce the whole time and like do yoga <laughs> all day. It's not that. <laughs> but if you want it to be that, like it can have that flavor too. But it's more like loving and nourishing yourself in all the ways through play through sunshine through ocean through yoga through sisterhood like meeting new friends trying new stuff um, getting to know different parts of yourself and so that's like a, an activation that I hold usually once to twice a year and it's been hard because of the pandemic and that's right. been like very interesting <laughs> But I've been doing it still the whole time, nonetheless, because I feel it's very important to gather in person. And like you picked up on my energy, I think something different happens in person when mm -hmm. I'm with people in the same space. So that's one of my favorite offerings. But when's the next also, one? Uh, that's going to be October, I think, 4th, like beginning of October of 2023. Okay. And people okay. can sign up now. They just go to my website, kelseyaida.com slash retreat and they'll get all the info there's a little application we get to just chat on zoom feel each other's vibe i'll tell you about the retreat and then if you want to come i'll get you in so yeah so your radical love course is that an online course is that a live yes. zoom thing like how do you how is that administered yeah so the radical self-love course which kind of inspired some of the curriculum at the retreat but the retreats are always different depending on the group but the course is an evergreen course online that people can do at their own pace so it's pre-recorded videos of me teaching these practices that I found to be the most beneficial along my self-love journey. Um, Cause there's so much stuff out there, but it's like, okay, but how do I love myself? Like, I know I need to love myself. I know I could love myself more, but I don't understand like how in a practical way. So that's what that is. And then there's a book that's like smaller, the mini book of self-love for the modern woman, which has some of the same practices, but there's more in the course. And they're more in depth in their video explanations in there. Um, and then as far as like free offerings, I have a podcast called High Vibe in It. So if you like hearing me <laughs> ramble about all the things and get excited and talk really fast, um, then you'll probably love that, which I co-host with my friend, Lindsay Robinson, who's a hypnotherapist. So that's fun because we're always talking about manifestation and getting your mind right and working with energy and just loving yourself, living your best life. What and about then, your books? What, yeah. what books have you written? Are they on yes. Amazon? I've written so many books. They're all on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> um, I won't go through every single one of them, but the last two, one is a manifesting journal called Letters to the Universe, which is fun if you are scripty type person, if you like to write things out with your hands. I found that to be one of the most powerful manifestation practices for me. Like if I want to create something, first thing I'm going to do is pick up my journal and do my little scripting process, which I always do, which is what I put in that book. So that's a fun interactive one. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, for anyone who is new or intermediate to the world of manifestation and wants like fun practices for different intentions. So let's say you want to manifest more financial abundance or you want to manifest more happiness or more romance in your life whatever it is just the basic things that most people want out of life there are exercises in that book my pocket guide to manifestation that I find very very valuable and there's even some resistance releasing work in there some journal work some visualization all different kinds of good stuff and then um affirmations for happiness it has all five star reviews on amazon that's a crowd pleaser which i did not anticipate because it's literally <laughs> just like an oracle deck but a book so you can like flip any page and it has like an affirmation and a little paragraph but it's just very much mm -hmm. like the happy medicine of the day like universe what what perspective do i need to take on right now what can i meditate on what can i think about for the rest of the day so affirmations that's for happiness wonderful. is like yeah it's a really beautiful cute little sunshiny book and then the self-love one. And then there's another um, affirmation one that I wrote earlier, but you can find them all on my website. If you search Kelsey Aida on Amazon, you'll find them all there. Almost all of them. 
three out of the five are in the big stores, little stores, like actually physically at Books A Million or Barnes and Noble. Um, but yeah, two of them I have wow. self-published. So those are just on Amazon. Congratulations. What a creator. No, that's awesome. I'm really, really impressed by you. Um, and I will put links in the description of this YouTube video and also in the podcast. So if you want to check her out, her Instagram, her books, her website, her retreats, I'll put it all in there so you can find it for sure. I thought maybe we would just leave it with uh, one last question <laughs> um, yeah, because we're it. about to tip over into 2023. It's the new year. This is when people are starting to dream the new reality. I'm going to have a resolution, honey. I'm going to lose 20 pounds. <laughs> yes. I'm going to start a new job. We're going to do things. So. Is there any kind of like little tippy poo that we could, some little ritual or something that we could do around New Year's to help us to manifest what we truly desire that you yes. might be able to offer? Yes, I have a great tip on this. And that's to make your goals smaller and more sustainable. Because I think what people do on New Year's is they try to go so big because they're so excited with like all the new year, new me, new vibes, going to be great. It's going to be everything's going to be so different than the last year, <laughs> right? And we're like, I'm going to drink 20 bottles of water a day, every day. I'm going to go to the gym like two hours, three times a week. And you just make your goals like a little bit too hardcore. And then people do it for a few days, few weeks, few months, but they lose stamina. They run out of energy because they didn't set it up in a way that was sustainable. So using the examples that I gave, mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of like 20 bottles of water a day, you start with like, okay, I'm going to drink one more bottle of water that day, or maybe like at each meal. Make it smaller, make it more doable, make it so it's a promise that you can truly keep to yourself. Mm. So instead of going so big or going home when you get tired of going big, maybe just like <laughs> shrink it down to more bite-sized pieces and do it in a way that can be long-term and sustainable. That would be my challenge slash tip to people when they're going into the new year and setting all these new resolutions. Go for it in bite size. Yeah, and there's just an accompanying ease when it's possible. <laughs> it's so, more gentle too, that yeah. approach. It's a more self-loving approach. Instead of yeah. expecting yourself to like change your whole life overnight just because it's a new year, which like we invented the calendars, like what if, is a new year? It's like, okay, what if we just incrementally worked towards yeah. our goals? My first book, hashtag actually I can, which I actually didn't mention in the long list of books <laughs> was all about like, using affirmations in an incremental way. So like, how can you climb the emotional scale instead of faking it till you make it, which I hate that approach because it doesn't work and it's so stupid. Like, how can you feel slightly better? How can you move towards relief? How can you feel a little bit more open? How can you feel a little bit better? How can we climb our way up vibrationally instead of trying to jump the Grand Canyon and then falling down the hole and then kicking yourself after like, man, I knew that wasn't going to work. So why did I do it anyway? <laughs> So I think more slow, more gentle, be supportive of yourself, break up your goals. Like you have time, you have time. <laughs> just give yourself some time and some grace. Absolutely. Yeah. Some compassion. You do work with people one-on-one -on -one as well, correct? And they can find mm -hmm. out all about that at your website. Well, yes. thank you so much, Kelsey. This has been a, such, you said you don't believe in fake it until you make it. And I want to go there, but we're not going to, because we're out of time, but maybe, <laughs> some, maybe in a future podcast, I'll have you back yes. and we can talk about that. Um, but it's been such a wonderful conversation. You are truly a light in this world. Thank you for all that you do, all of your beautiful offerings. I can just feel how you're connected and how they serve so many people and just thankful and so much gratitude to you. And thank you for being on the Life Magnetics podcast. Yes, thank you for having me. It's been so fun.